Hello and welcome to the November Crane Research Forum. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Dr. Rebecca Dorr and I'm the Director of Research here at the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. My colleague Kathy is going to be monitoring our chat box today and we'll be adding some housekeeping items there. So keep an eye on that. Uh, these monthly forums feature research on emerging or key topics that impact the field of early childcare and education. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Nathaniel Bryan. Dr. Bryan is an Associate Professor of Early Childhood Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Texas, Austin. Dr. Bryan's research investigates three interrelated areas. First, the constructed identities and teaching styles of Black male teachers in early childhood education. Two, the lived schooling experiences, critical literacy development, and Black boyhood play and three, teacher preparation for urban early childhood education to better address the needs of Black boys. Dr. Bryan is author of the books Toward a Black Boy Crit Ped Pedagogy, Black Boys, Male Teachers, and Early Childhood Classrooms. Dr. Bryan also serves on the editorial board of the Journal of African American Males in Education. He has presented nationally and internationally on equity and diversity issues in the schooling experiences of Black boys. He's received prestigious awards such as the 2020 Emerging Scholar Award from the American Educational Association Special Interest Group, Critical Perspectives on Early Childhood Education. Today, Dr. Bryan will be discussing a critical understanding of Black boyhood play in early childhood education. I'm really looking forward to this presentation and discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Bryan. And you are still on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca, for such a powerful introduction. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here with you all today. Glad that you uh, took the time out of your busy schedule to share in this important conversation. Uh, it's not often that we have uh, discussions about Black boys in early child education, and particularly Black boyhood play. So I hope that you will find this uh, conversation engaging, thought-provoking, and I, help, I hope that it will help inform the way that you view and perceive the play styles and behaviors of Black boyhood play. Uh, before I begin, I must think, thank some very important people. Uh, first to Dr. Laura Justice and the Crane Center for this invitation, and for some fine colleagues who also serve as mentors at uh, the Ohio State University, Dr. Ford, Dr. Elaine Richardson, and Dr. Cynthia Tyson. I just wanted to just thank them. It's because of their work and their mentorship that I'm here today and that I'm doing the kind of work in early child education that I'm currently doing. So I'm gonna jump right into today's discussion. Uh, and uh, hopefully again, that this will allow you to uh, and think deeply about your own uh, prax practices and practices relative to Black boys. Uh, I want to just start off by sharing that uh, I want to talk about confronting the injustices of Black boyhood play and early child education. However, I'm putting the word in in parentheses because I want us to understand that although Black boys are uh, everyday victims of uh, racialized and gendered violence during play, they also enjoy experiences, uh, play experiences in their homes and schools and communities. So I want us to lean into that as well. So I think it's important to talk about uh, the structures that obviate Black boyhood play, but also the joy, the hope, and possibilities of Black boyhood play. And I also want us to think about Black boys from a, a multidimensional perspective, because there's more than one way to be a boy. So we have to challenge our one-dimensional heteronormative view of what it means to be a Black boy. And particularly, our understanding of play should also be expansive to include uh, activities beyond the physical. Like we so often uh, engage with Black boys when they are playing sports, et cetera. But play is also linguistics. And in linguistic, it, is, it has many different dimensions that we should lean into. And as I talk about Black boyhood play today, this is not an opportunity to ignore the ways in which other minoritized uh, children 
or disadvantaged during play. So I'm also holding space to honor uh, the, 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 the black, uh, black uh, racialized, anti-black anti racialized violence and uh, brown violence that children of color uh, face during play. So I'm also, as I talk about black boyhood play, I'm also holding space for us to think about the experiences of other minoritized children, especially black girls. I would like to start uh, my presentation by having you to just engage with me a little bit, and you can feel free to use the chat. I want you to reflect on your most memorable, mo most memorable childhood play experience. So if you can use one word to describe that most uh, memorable childhood play experience, I would invite you to put that into the chat box. Thank you. I'm beginning to see some very powerful words like creativity, imaginative, laughter, safe, outdoor, family, fun. Thank you so much for sharing those words. And much like you all, I enjoyed play. My play was very imaginative and creative. I grew up in the urban centers of Charleston, South Carolina, where I often played on Mall Park. And it was the place where I built relationships with friends, you know, and family members. I actually had an opportunity to revisit this park a few months ago. And when I did, it brought back all of the, the instances of joy that I experienced during my, uh, my boyhood years. And so play has played a significant role in my life. Even today, I find myself playing with video games, et cetera. But it wasn't until graduate school that I learned that play wasn't al always a joyful experience. I learned that play wasn't always transformative. It wasn't always full of laughter and creativity. Uh, in my graduate school, I learned about the kissing case of 1958 that took place in Monroe, North Carolina. Uh, Seven-year-old James Thompson and David Simpson was playing in a a community with a white child whose name is Sissy. Sissy invited the boys to kiss her on the cheek. However, she returned home and she shared with her mom what happened and her mom called the police to say that David and James had molested uh, Sissy. Both James and David were arrested until community activists stood up to advocate on the behalf of the boys and as such, they were released. These are the types of experiences that Black boys face during play. And given this particular history, it helps me to understand why uh, Black boys like Kamari Harrison uh, face traumatic experiences during play as well. So it is important that we connect the history to uh, the, our present and our future. I want you to take a few moments to listen to Kamari's story. And before I share this story, I want you to know that Kamari is a brilliant Black boy who loved playing, who enjoyed school. However, he was subjected to uh, racialized and gendered violence during play. Overkill. Now that's how the father of a Jefferson Parish student describes the suspension his son faced. It happened after the boy's teacher saw a BB gun in his bedroom during an online class not on campus. As Danny Monteverdi reports, the family now wants the boy's record cleared. Nine-year-old Kamari Harrison was back in his virtual classroom Thursday, but only after being suspended for something his father describes as an overreaction. He just went ahead and, and went along with it and blew it out of proportion. On September 11th, the Woodmere Elementary fourth grader was taking a test in his bedroom, his classroom these days, when his brother walked in carrying a BB gun. Kamari picked it up when it fell down and put it next to his seat. His father says that's when problems began. You could kind of see a portion of it through the screen and whatnot, you know, for a split second. A behavior report filed by Kamari's teacher at Woodmere Elementary in Harvey says he presented a weapon that appeared to be a rifle or shotgun during his Google Meets classroom session. This is a violation of weapons in the classroom setting 
and a violation of the internet usage policy. He will be recommended for expulsion per Jefferson Parish Public School System policy. An attorney for the family says the school system says on-campus policies are in effect for distance learning. A six-day suspension followed. The Jefferson Parish School System says it does not comment on individual students and their records. It says teachers and administrators are allowed to use reasonable discipline to keep order. Nyron Harrison says he now worries about his son's future after a brief moment from his past. This outcome is going to follow him through the rest of his life and whatnot, you know, and, and, and that's what's not allowing me to accept that those uh, they decision. This was grossly mishandled. Chelsea uh, Burner Cusimano is representing the Harrison family. She says the Jefferson Parish school system needs to reconsider its decision to have a suspension on Kamari's record, considering this happened at his home. We do not condone weapons on campus. The Harrison family does not condone weapons on campus, but there is a, a this is apples and oranges. And they say it's one lesson they're sorry Kamari had to learn. Danny Monteverdi, Eyewitness News. Well, the Harrison family, their attorney says if the school system does not agree to clear that suspension from Kamari's record, they will file a lawsuit. Overkill. One thing that was not brought up in this particular story is the fact that police officers were sent to Kamari's home to conduct a wellness check. And we, I find it particularly unbelievable to conduct a wellness check on Black boys when educators, particularly school administrators, do not care about the well-being of Black boys when they are in the physical school building. So how should we believe that uh, school officials were concerned about Omari's well-being when they don't even pr protect Black boys from their anti-Black misandric well-being, uh, unwell-being in schools? Right. And so this example of Kamari's uh, case is a clear example of the virtual school to prison pipeline where black and brown children are funneled from virtual or remote, remote learning spaces into the cr cr uh, criminal justice system for minor infractions. And oftentimes, of course, these infractions are subjective. Right. And this is also an act of spirit murder. Right. This this trauma, this spiritual and physical trauma that is associated with being simply black and boy in a racist uh, and capitalistic society. Right. And when black boys aren't spiritually murdered, they are, they're also physically murdered. We must be reminded of the story of 12 year old Tamir Rice, who was playing in an open carry state of Ohio and was mistakenly perceived as a 21-year-old Black male brandishing a weapon and threatening adults who were nearby. Although uh, uh, Ohio is an open carry state, it is also uh, carrying openly injustices against Black boys, right? And so we cannot forget the physical death of Tamir Rice during Black boyhood play. And this Kamari situation and Tamir's situation is a clear example of what it means to live and play in the afterlife of slavery. So Daya Hartman talks about this racial and political ca uh, calculus that was put in place centuries ago, but yet still has dehumanizing and damaging inf impact on Black people and particularly children. Right? And so I'm grappling with this question. What does it say about a nation and a schooling system that pathologize and criminalize Black boys? This is something that we should think about, right? If we're really willing to overturn or overhaul the ways in which Black boys experience uh, anti-Black misandric or racial and gendered violence during play, right? Just a little background on play. We know in early child education, play is quite quite foundational to the field. Uh, and most scholars uh, illuminate how uh, children who engage in play benefit academically and socially. However, what is under discussed in the literature is how play uh, also is informed by people's social or children's social and political experiences. And play is an, uh, an, uh, is an institution of also privilege and power. As such, I refer to play or childhood play as being white property. That means that white children uh, have opportunities to engage in play and recreation uh, more so than uh, children of color and particularly uh, black boys, right? 
And be, Black boys are oftentimes denied play and recreation because of the ways in which we perceive them, right? There, there, there's larger misperceptions of Black boys that uh, are mapped onto their play experiences. Oftentimes, people consider Black boys to be what scholars suggest are folk devils, are those who are deviant, who are dangerous. And as such, those misnomers are mapped onto their play styles and behaviors. And unfortunately, teachers uh, oftentimes have these deficit views and perspectives of Black boyhood play, which negatively uh, impacts how they experience early childhood education. Let's take a listen to some of the consequences of teacher biases and stereotypes of Black boyhood play. There's a new study out of the Yale Child Study Center that I had to read a few times just to believe what it was telling me. The researchers recruited about 135 preschool teachers. They had them watch video footage of four kids playing, a black boy, a black girl, a white boy, and a white girl. And they told the teachers, their subjects, watch the video, there may be some challenging behaviors. As soon as you see something that could become challenging, hit the enter key on your keypad. Well, here's the trick. There was no challenging behavior. The researchers were using eye scan technology to see which child the teachers were looking at the most. And what they found is that the teachers, both white and black alike, spent the most time watching the black boy, waiting for bad behavior that never came. There's one more really interesting headline in this study, which comes later. The teachers were also given a one paragraph description to read of a hypothetical child with a stereotypical name who behaves pretty badly in class, pushes, scratches, throws toys. And some of the teachers were also given some biographical information that helped make sense of that behavior. They were told that the child lives with his mother, uh, father has been in and out for years, they're relatively poor, the mother is depressed, works three jobs. The researchers wanted to know if knowing this information made the teachers more empathetic to the kid. Well, here's the shock. It, it did, but only if the teacher and the child were of the same race. If the teacher and the child, a white teacher and a black child, or even a black teacher and a white child, knowing that biographical information, those teachers were less empathetic towards those students. And here's why this matters. Imagine, if this is true, if there's this empathy deficit in preschool, well, imagine where else that's true. That's a, a very important question, and it could possibly explain why, uh, why there are empathy deficits uh, that exist uh, throughout American society for black men and boys. Building on uh, the Yale Childhood Study, I wanted to investigate further uh, the impacts of the consequences of teacher biases and stereotypes of black boyhood. Was a new so I had an opportunity to interview five early childhood educators, uh, one black male, one black female and three white uh, female teachers who had varying years of experiences in er early child education and in urban school settings. Right? And so I, again, I wanted to know how their uh, teacher biases and stereotypes impacted the ways in which black boys experience play. And here is what I learned that black boys experience what I call the three anti-Black misandric restrictions of Black boyhood and boyhood play. And what I mean by anti-Black misandric is this, or uh, misandry, is this particular disdain and disgust for Black boys as uh, concretized and institutionalized in American uh, laws and policies, but also school policies and practices, right? And so here are these three anti-Black misandric restrictions uh, that Black boys endure during uh, play and recreation in early childhood classrooms. And the first First one is this restriction of time. The second is this restriction of space. And last and certainly not least, this notion of the restrictions of interaction. I would like to share some of the comments that the teachers shared uh, about uh, uh, engaging in these exclusionary discipline practices uh, in terms of Black boyhood play. Here we have Jerry again, who uh, is a Black male teacher. And here is what Jerry says about uh, uh, restricting time relative to Black boyhood play. 
He, he says, because it was, was like a school-wide plan when students misbehave, I would not take all the boys' playtime away from them, but I would tell them they had to spend five, 10, or even 15 a minute standing against the wall. Here, Jerry is in identifying the ways in which school policies inform the way that he uh, restricted the playtime and experiences of Black boys. So rather than allowing them to engage with their peers, he suggested that he took time away from them uh, as an act of exclusionary discipline, right? And so we suggest that we need more Black male teachers in early childhood spaces. However, if we're not sending Black male teachers who are critically conscious of the ways in which anti-Black misandry operates in school settings and particularly early child education classrooms, we don't really need to recruit uh, Black male teachers, right? And we need to ensure that they are entering uh early childhood spaces with critical dispositions to allow them to push back against the anti-Black misandry that Black boys face in school schooling spaces, right? And Karen also suggests that she restricted uh, Black boys' boyhood play. Uh, she says, like I told him, if he didn't do his work, like he can play, but he will only play the last 10 minutes of recess. Here, Karen is using play as a punishment for a, a, her black male student who did not uh, complete his assignment, right? And this is a common practice in early childhood education classrooms where teachers take away playtime uh, uh, because students may fail to engage in uh, culturally unresponsive activities that they are oftentimes assigned. And Jerry also talks about the ways in which he restricted the play space of the Black boys with whom he worked. He said, so when I was in my internship, we had the Black boys take laps around the playground. And then once I started teaching, teaching, it would be sitting on the wall. I remember times when I would have them sitting on the walls and watch other classes play. And I'm like, what did I really accomplish? What was the goal? Was the behavior fixed by me making them sit on the wall? So again, Jerry acknowledges the fact that he restricted the play spaces of the Black boys with whom he taught. But what I like about Jerry, he was also critical of his restriction of the space, which allow him to really think deeply about rather this particular practice was effective in terms of improving uh, the, the behaviors of, of Black boys in his classroom. And then, Phyllis also agreeing with Jerry, she also mentions how she restricted the, the play spaces of Black boys in her early childhood educational space. And she says, and I also used play as punishment my first years of teaching. That was just what was used at our school and nobody ever told me what else to do. So when I had kids hitting each other, kids punching each other, it was like, I didn't know what else to do other than to have them sit on the bench or to have them stand on the wall. And like Jerry said, that didn't fix the behavior, having them stay on the, uh, on the wall or anything. And so what Phyllis brings attention to is that because she did not have a uh, prior preparation in terms of engaging black boys during play, she acquiesced to the practices that were already institutionalized in her schooling space. So much like her colleagues in general, she also used play as punishment. So this uh, notion of uh, restricting play really suggest that we should think about what's happening in our pre-service teacher education programs. Are we allowing teachers to take courses and on play that would allow them to think critically about play and particularly the play styles and behaviors of, of Black boys? Jerry again talks about how he also restricted the interactions of the Black boys with, uh, with whom he worked. Uh, he suggests, he said, did I still have behavior issues because they're antsy after being still all day and now they have to sit on the wall and watch their friends play in, in the only 30 minutes of the whole day 
that they get to play with their friends. Here, he alludes to the fact that not only was he taking away their playtime, but he was also taking away their interactions with their peers. And as I stated earlier, much of the dominant research in early childhood education suggests that when young children engage in play and recreation, they build uh, social skills. However, if teachers are restricting the interactions that Black boys have with their peers, they are really uh, negatively impacting the de development or the social development of Black boys during play. Karen also talks about the ways in which she restricted a Black boys' interaction during play. And here's what she says. And, and then with black boy play specifically, I'm like having trouble kind of like putting into words my experience with it. I think Jerry hit on it, where it's like, it's like black boys are seen as rough very quickly, whereas girls will be seen as like, oh, like she's just like being sassy. It seems like it's written off. And then, so I saw a lot of that, a lot of that like rough housing or something. And this is the kind of like a personal thing I'm uncomfortable with. I don't like allow or like gunplay in my room. So a lot of times because they pick like sticks or something and pretend it's a gun, I'll be like, hey, please don't do that at school. Again, I mentioned earlier that teachers have very biased and stereotypical views of black boyhood play. And although it appears that she was uh, being uh, empathetic towards the black boys, she was also she was also centering her own personal uh, views and perspectives of, of the, the use or play with guns, toy guns or imaginative, imaginative guns. And we know that white boys play regularly with guns and they're never chastised in the way that other children and particularly minoritized children are chastised when they play with uh, toy guns, right? And so here, although it seems like she was being empathetic, she was ab absolutely not being empathetic, but centering her own personal uh, feelings about uh, gun play in her classroom. So here she was restricting Black boys' interactions with material uh, goods, and, and she was also uh, restricting Black boys' uh, imaginative play. Right. And so thinking about uh, these teachers and their interactions and restrictions of Black boyhood play, I argue in my work that Black boys are socially constructed as spatially uh, and temporally and interactionally illegitimate. That means that their bodies are oftentimes marked undesirable in place spaces, including those spaces in early child education. And Black boys are oftentimes deemed unworthy or undeserving of playtime and recreation, right, with other children. And of course, there, uh, re there are restrictions in terms, with, uh, in terms of objects that they can use uh, to engage in play. And so teachers, as early as early child education, must contest the ways in which Black boys are socially constructed as spatially, temporally, and interactionally illegitimate during play. And so we're all complicit when Black boys cannot enjoy or engage in the hopes and possibility of Black boyhood play. Despite all of the institutional and structural uh, forces that obviate the ways in which Black boys uh, engage in play, we must also see Black boys as ag agentic beings, that they have agency and power that they use to resist uh, the restrictions uh, in order to assert their rights, uh, to giggle, to pout and cry, and just be as frivolous as other children, as uh, Dr. Michael Dumas and Joseph Nelson uh, have mentioned, right? And so we should not only focus on the pain and suffering or the dehumanization of Black boys during play, but we should also uh, uh, find opportunities to celebrate uh, the, the agency of Black boyhood play, right? And so here is an example of a Black boy uh, demonstrating his agency uh, during play. Let's take a listen. Where's five? Yeah. Hold it up. Yeah. All, yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, clap for yeah. King. Yeah. <laughs> clap yeah. for King, all right? King, show us number one. 
All right, clap for King. Clap for King. Okay. King, show us number two. Number two, King. All right, clap for King. Here we see a black boy uh, engage in play, and there, there's this hope and this joy and the uh, possibilities of their, their play. You have one boy encouraging uh, his friend uh, as he engaged in the math activity. And what you see operationalized there is this notion of what uh, Dr. Jamel Miller and I call other brothering, uh, honoring the ways in which Black boys support each other uh, academically and socially. So we really need to find opportunities to celebrate the agency of Black boyhood play in such a way that we are leveraging and honoring and valuing the ways in which they engage in other brothering during play or uh, supporting the academic and social uh, needs of each other during play. And we don't oftentimes uh, shine light on the ways in which Black boys uh, support each other in early childhood education or the ways in which they engage in other brothering in early child education. So I want to encourage teachers to find ways to leverage and celebrate the, uh, the agency that Black boys uh, engage in during play. And here's another example of a Black boy demonstrating his agency during play. For those of you who may be familiar with, uh, with Black uh, spiritual practices, uh, you uh, may understand what's happening, but I, will, I want you to watch the video first and then I will share uh, what's, what's going on here. So here what you see is a, a young Black boy engaging in what we call spiritual play. He's actually imitating the styles of many Black pe uh, preachers uh, that he may have witnessed in his uh, church community. And so we again, we need to hold space to celebrate the, the spiritual play in which Black boys engage during play, all right, as another way to celebrate the agency of Black boyhood play. And so given the fact that I want to acknowledge the, the anti-Blackness Andrea or the racialized and gender violence that Black boys face during play and to celebrate the joy and hope and possibilities of uh, Black boyhood play, I introduced this concept called Black Play Crit. And Black Play Crit is a theoretical and pedagogical tools that teachers and theorists can, and researchers can use to acknowledge the, the violence that Black boys experience during play, but also to acknowledge the joyful experiences in the rich histories of Black boyhood play. And I draw on four important critical theories to, to develop this conceptualization of Black Play Crit. And the first uh, critical theory is uh, critical race theory. And of course, critical race theory is socially constructed in media and popular press as the uh, as folk devil, as something deviant. But critical race theory is an important theory to help us to understand the racialized experiences of people of color and particularly, particularly children. And so what CRT scholars argue is that race and racism are endemic to American institutions, including early childhood education. I also draw on Black critical theory. Although critical race theory is a general critique of race, which honors the varying histories that uh, racialized people experience, Black critical theory focused specifically on the, uh, the Black experience. It focused specifically on the notion of anti-Blackness or the particular disdain and disgust for Black people uh, that is uh, concretized in the laws and policies of the land. And with respect to children, we have to think about how anti-Blackness is uh, concretized in early childhood and all other educative spaces. And drawing on uh, 
Black geographies, I also uh, draw on this notion of anti-Black spatial imaginary introduced by Dr. DeMarcus Jenkins. And what DeMarcus argues is that race and place and space, uh, uh, race, pl excuse me, place and race uh, our race and space are racialized, right? So wherever the Black body dwells, it, it's a racialized space for Black people. In addition to critical race theory and Black critical theory and anti-Black spatial imaginary, I also draw on uh, this notion of Black male study, which comes out of Africana uh, philosophy introduced by Dr. Tommy Curry. Dr. Curry argues that whereas critical race theory does an exceptional job uh, illuminating the racialized experiences of Black men, it does not oftentimes uh, serve to provide a, a, a thorough or robust explanation of the, the gendered experiences of Black men. And Dr. Curry argues that we need to talk about this notion of anti-Black misandry or the racialized, the sexualized, and the gendered violence that Black boys and men experience during play. In his conceptualization of Black male studies, he also introduces this notion of the public uh, philosophy of Black men and boys, which he argues is that uh, we need to not only identify the ways in which the institution, American institution that is, is socially constructed against the Black male body, but we also need to, uh, to really shift our view and perspectives about Black men and boys. In other words, he's asking us to draw on strength-based views uh, to think about uh, Black men and boys. So drawing on these four important uh theoretical frameworks, I introduce again what I call Black Play Crit. And Black Play Crit has three uh, what I call developing ideas. And I term them developing ideas because it is my hope and desire that other scholars come along to extend these, uh, these uh, developing ideas. Uh, it's also my way of showing the flexibility of uh, Black Play Crit. And so the first uh, developing idea is this notion of play not. And what play not suggests is that before we begin to talk about Black boyhood play, we have to think about the ways in which Black boys' bodies are socially constructed in, in the white imaginary, right? And so we have to think about the ways in which uh, these biases and stereotypes uh, of Black boyhood play uh, uh, limits the ways in which they engage in and play and recreation. Uh, play not can also serve uh, or lead to dire consequences uh, for Black boys, much like we saw with Kamari and Tamir Rice, right? And so again, when we think about play not, we have to think about the stereotypes and biases uh, surrounding uh, the social construction of Black boys' bodies. And the second developing idea is this notion of play past, play present, and future nexus. And so what this suggests is that in order to understand the present and future play conditions of Black boys, we have to engage historically. We have to take a historical gaze. We have to understand how during enslavement, Black children were denied play and recreation. They, they were oftentimes forced to work alongside their, their enslaved parents in, in fields, right? And but there were times where black children played with white children. However, when they were playing with white children, they were oftentimes playing with white children to learn uh, English so that they can take the English skills back to their parents so that they can escape the enslavement uh, plantation, right? And so I argued during enslavement, whereas white children were freely playing, black children, especially boys, were playing for freedom. And last and certainly not least, uh, the notion of the public philosophy of Black boyhood play. Uh, so this particular uh, developing idea suggests that we need to shift the ways in which we view a Black boyhood play, right? And so it's also a pedagogical tool that teachers can use to celebrate the hope, the joy, and possibilities of Black boyhood play as a way to create joyful and safe play spaces for Black boys, right? And so these are the three developing ideas of Black uh, play crit. 
So teachers, uh, scholars and researchers who in, embrace uh, Black play crit, they must first believe, know, and do these particular things, right? And so the first thing I believe that black, uh, teachers who embrace Black uh, play crit sh should believe is that Black boys have the right to play safely and to have a uh, curated spaces that would allow them to in, engage in joyful play experiences. And they should also believe that Black boys have the right to be just as frivolous as any other children, right? They have the right to giggle, to pout, to cry, and to play in, it, in whatever manner they, they choose. And so teachers who embrace Black play crit should also know the history surrounding Black boyhood play, much like I mentioned earlier, uh, the ways in which uh, Black boys were denied play and recreation uh, uh, during enslavement, we should also think about that history as a way to push back against the ways in which Black boys are oftentimes restricted uh, during play in and beyond early childhood classrooms. Right? And then teachers who embrace Black play crit must push back against this notion of adultification where black boys, uh, innocent black boys receive adult-like and particularly men-like consequences for, uh, for being black and boy, right? So teachers must push back against adultification uh, to create uh, joyful and safe, uh, safe place spaces for black boys. And when teachers who embrace black boyhood Crit, uh, black uh, play crit uh, uh, believe no, they must also do right. So they must challenge their own uh, challenge their own uh, perceived uh, misbehaviors or the perceived misbehaviors of black boys, right? And they must be intentional about creating joyful play spaces and and confront the desire to restrict the ways in which black boys play in in, in early childhood classrooms and teachers who embrace Black uh, play crit must also hold space for Black boys to share some of the games and activities that they are accustomed to engaging in their homes and communities. So where do we go from here? In, 19, in the 1960s, Dr. King wrote a book, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or, or Community. And in that, he outlined the ways in which society had, had dehumanized Black bodies, minds, and spirits, and the ways in which not only the, their race impacted the ways in which they experience uh, American society, but also their social economic status. So he provided some recommendations on how America could ensure that they were providing opportunities for uh, Black people to engage as American citizens. So with that work in mind, I want us to think about where do we go from here? I want us to think about strategies to support Black boys and Black boyhood play. And I think teachers must first acknowledge the anti-Black misandry that they may bring to early childhood spaces. And in acknowledging the anti-Black misandry, it requires you to ask deep questions. It requires you to ask, why do I believe uh, th this way about Black boys? Why do I think this way about Black boys? And where does this anti-Black misandry come from, right? Where did I learn this anti-Black misandry that prevents the way, that, that prevents the way I see uh, Black boyhood play? And I do believe that teachers should collaborate with uh, administrators and uh, other uh, uh, school uh, uh, faculty members to really think about and examine disciplinary policies, right? Because it's oftentimes embedded in the policy, policies that anti-Black misandry exists, right? And so I think it's important for us to really examine our disciplinary policies to see if Black boys are being targeted and profiled filed in ways that other children aren't. And most importantly, I believe that we should hold space to listen to Black boys. Often black, oftentimes, Black boys are telling us what needs to happen in schooling spaces, but because of the social constructed construction of Black boys' bodies and because of the ways we perceive Black boys, we oftentimes silence their voices. 
And so this is an opportunity to ensure that we're curating spaces to listen, hear, and understand Black boys, uh, black boys about their play styles and behaviors. And teachers collectively should work to create humanizing and liberatory play spaces in, in and beyond early childhood classrooms, right? And because of the ways in which play is being uh, stripped away out of early child education to be replaced by uh, uh, academic uh, experiences, uh, teachers must find opportunities to infuse play in, in the curriculum in ways that celebrate the joy and possibilities of Black boyhood play. And last and certainly not least, I think that we all need to continue to, uh, to educate ourselves about Black boyhood play. And in this way, if we do these things, we can certainly confront the injustices of Black boyhood play. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here to answer those questions. I would also like to refer you to uh, two uh, important professional resources that I think illuminate uh, Black boyhood play and the experiences uh, or the play experiences of Black children in general. So toward a Black boy crit pedagogy, Black boys, male teachers, and early childhood classroom practices. Uh, it has several chapters on uh, Black boyhood play. And uh, this new publication uh, co-authored with Dr. Gloria Swindra Bhutti and Dr. Kamanya Rice uh, called Revolutionary Love for Early Childhood Classrooms, Nurturing the Brilliance of Young Black Children. And here we talk about creating joyful play spaces for Black children in general. Again, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to engaging in conversation with you. If you would like to contact me, here's my information. Uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brian, for that presentation. We have a lot of questions coming in the chat, so I'll get started with those. Um, but audience, please continue to add your questions there and um, take a look and upvote, upvote questions that you want to hear Dr. Brian answer, because we may not be able to get to all of these in the time we have remaining today. Um, I'm going to start with the one that was updated, upvoted the most during your talk. Um, theft of time, space, and interactions from Black boys and men sound like the function of the plantation and prison. It also sounds like PBIS, restorative practices, and other behavioral management projects that punish Black boys and men. Can you talk about pro-Black boy designs of schools and spaces? That's a, that's a really good question. And I think when we talk about pro-Black designs, I think Black boys have to be a part of that design. I don't think teachers or educators themselves should uh, socially construct these pro-Black designs without centering the voices and experiences of Black boys in those designs. So it goes back to my recommendation, listen and hear Black boys so that they can inform the way we think about these pro-Black uh, design play spaces uh, to support their cultural ways and gendered ways of knowing and being. Great, thank you. Um, another question that was asked is, is there research or literature on more appropriate interaction strategies or a consequence system for Black boys instead of taking away play, like you were talking about earlier in your presentation? Um, what is being shown that Black boys are responding to? Right, so I'm currently conducting studies on uh, uh, focusing on that very same thing, like really thinking about ways that teachers can better support Black boyhood play. And what I'm finding uh, in this particular research is just really finding opportunities to infuse play across the curriculum, right? And so when teachers begin to see uh, play as a curricular and pedagogical practice, I think it begins to minimize their, their negative interactions with Black boys in early childhood spaces. So really leveraging uh, the curriculum and, and, and pedagogical practices as tools to celebrate the hopes, the joys, and the possibilities uh, of Black boyhood play as a way to mitigate uh, teachers' tendency to engage in these anti-Black misandric practices, such as taking play away from Black boys as a mechanism, uh, as a consequence, a consequence. Right. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we have another question while we're on the topic of teachers. Um, how is Black boyhood play impacted by white teachers versus Black teachers? I know you mentioned that 
uh, briefly, but this uh, questioner wants, wants some more information on that topic. Yeah, so in the Yale Childhood Study, uh, Dr. Gilliam and his team uh, identified the ways in which Black teachers and white teachers were stereotypical or had stereotypical views of Black boyhood play. So we have to work with Black teachers just as much as we work with white teachers to undo the internalized anti-Blackness they may face uh, during play, that Black boys face during play. Right. Interesting. Thank you. Um, another question coming in, and it came in, you know, partway through your talk. Can you suggest some books that celebrate Black boyhood play, which was mentioned in your Believe No Do slide? And obviously you had your some of your books at the end, but I wondered if you had any other recommendations for the audience today. Yeah, there are books. Uh, there's a book by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He celebrates Black boyhood play, and that's my go-to book. And there are also a list of other children's books in the two books that I reference. And so feel free to purchase those books, and you'll see a host of uh, the activities and, and, and literature that you can use to uh, support the celebration of Black boyhood play. Great, thank you. And Kathy um, is putting the names of your books again in the in the chat for folks. Um, uh, another question came in. In your scholarly opinion, are there any connections that you've been able to make with how teachers are perceiving Black boys and the teacher's experience learning American history and the potential lapse of their own educational understanding of the founding of the country and their inability to humanize Black boys? Yeah, I think it's all interconnected, right? So when teachers aren't uh, having opportunities to learn about uh, rich Black histories, they walk away with deficit perspectives about Black people. And, and those deficit perspectives also play out in early childhood classrooms. So in this age of banning books and banning Black history, we have to think about the long-term long impact of doing that, right? So what messages are we sending to uh, young white girls who are most likely to become teachers in the future, right? So are we perpetuating this cycle of anti-Blackness when we refuse to teach Black history uh, in, in classrooms? I would say, yes, we are. And so it is so important that we find uh, opportunities to infuse Black history in the curriculum as a way to prevent uh, this long-term uh, anti anti-Black suffering, and particularly anti-Black Miss Andre uh, that Black boys face during play. Right. And I think this next question is, is related. How do we get graduate programs and educators to take Miss Andre more seriously? Right. I first think that we have to de decolonize our syllabus, right? I think Dr. Donna Ford just wrote uh, an article about decolonizing uh, the, the, our syllabus. So who whose work are we sharing as we teach courses on play? Are we, ins are we ensuring that we're holding space uh, for the work of scholars of color who are most oftentimes victims of racism and gender? Are we holding space to share those perspectives so that we can develop uh, an understanding of how we should engage with children of color during during play. So I think it's it requires us to first start with decolonizing our curriculum, decolonizing our syllabi, decolonizing our pedagogical practices at the undergraduate and graduate level. Right, absolutely. Um, another question came in, what are the health consequences of Black boys who endure anti-misandric harm by school? Is it like John Henryism and weathering where the brain, body, and spirit create negative health consequences? Thank you for this amazing work, they said. Yes, absolutely. There are long-term health consequences that we don't talk about enough in early child education. Teachers aren't taught to think about the ways in which their anti-Black misandric practices will lead to not only... Uh, academic deficiencies, but also social and health deficiencies, right? And so we need to start having conversations about weathering in early child education so that teachers can work against this tendency to dehumanize Black children, right? And I think this is the way that we will see better health outcomes in Black communities, particularly among uh, Black men and boys, right? And I think 
not even thinking long term. We need to think about the ways in which Black boys in early child education experience health outcomes, these de 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 deficit or deficient health outcomes. We have to think about how, you know, the racialized trauma uh, may show up in, in early childhood where Black boys may say, oh, I don't want to go to school because my, my tummy hurts or, you know, I have a headache, right? And so all of these are consequences of being subjected to anti-Black misandry in early childhood classrooms. Right, thanks. I'm getting a, a question from the chat. If you can um, repeat the title of your other book, we have the Black Boy Crit one, but not can you repeat the other one. Yeah, it's called Revolutionary Love for Early Childhood Classrooms, Nurturing the Brilliance of Black Children. Thank you so much. Um, another question, um, someone thanking you for your time and dedication to this work. I know we are focused on transforming ECE policies, practices, and teacher engagement with Black boys, but given what we know, what do parents of Black boys need to know? How should they engage when searching for schools as well as collaborating with schools? And how can we best prepare our children? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? You went out just a bit there. Sure. Um, given what we we know, how do parents of Black boys, what do parents of Black boys need to know? How should they engage when searching for schools as well as collaborating with schools? And how can we best prepare our children for engaging in the school environments? Yeah. I think parents need to understand the ways in which schools are socially constructed against Black boys. Oftentimes, parents acquiesce to dominant views and perspectives of Black boys themselves. And, and so it doesn't allow them to see the ways in which schools are socially constructed to disadvantage Black boys. So I would suggest that Black parents uh, uh, need to build their critical consciousness of the ways in which anti-Blackness, Andrea, or anti-Blackness is concretized in American institutions, in, including early child education. For for example, I had a conversation with one of my graduate students uh, not so long ago who has a son, and she said that her son was suspended uh, from school for hugging his white teacher who suggested that uh, the child was uh, engaging in some sexual acts, right? And so she automatically accepted uh, what school administrators said rather than being critical of the system of schooling that socially construct Black boys as hypersexual uh, and even in early child education. So I do believe that uh, we need to work with Black parents to continue to develop critical consciousness about the ways in which schools are socially constructed, and particularly early child education is socially constructed against the Black boy mind, body, soul, and spirit. Right. Thanks. Try to get two more quick questions in here. One, um, is Black Play Crit intended to ex extend to all minoritized children or to stay centered on Black boys? That's a really great question. It is my hope again and desire that other scholars extend the work. Uh, I would like to see this work uh, used to illuminate the experiences of Black girls, but I don't feel qualified to do that. I'm, I don't live uh, the life of a Black girl and haven't ever lived the life of a Black girl. So scholars who uh, engage and work on Black girls and other minoritized children should feel uh, the need to extend this work, to center the experience experiences of that those populations. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then finally, do you have any thoughts on Black boyhood play as it relates to Black boys with disabilities? Wow, that's a really, a really great question because because I was just thinking about that this morning. Uh, returning to the story of Tamir Rice, what we need to understand is that Tamir Rice was a child with a disability, a child who loved school, who loved his parents. And I thinking about my own framework, I I don't think I really held space to consider you know, how does this particular framework speak to uh, the experiences of Black boys with disabilities? So it is something that I'm currently thinking through right now. So hopefully in the coming uh, months or years, I would you centered uh, disability studies in this particular framework. Great. Well, stay, stay tuned. We'll have to have you back. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful presentation and conversation. Thank you again for sharing your work with us, Dr. Brian. Thank you all so much for inviting me. 
And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, when you leave the meeting today, a very short survey will pop up. Please do fill that out if you have a moment. We really do value your feedback and use it to inform um, our future events. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great day.